Welcome to the Integrated Schools Podcast. I'm Andrew, a white dad from Denver. And I'm Courtney, a white mom from Los Angeles. This is the fifth episode of our special series, Brown v. Board at 65, The Stories We Tell Ourselves. And while we've had a lot of scholarship up to this point, this week we're going to do something a bit different. Yeah, we are. This episode, I hope they hear it in our voices, is a conversation with two black parents about their experiences in mostly white schools today. Right. So this this week is the actual Brown v. Board anniversary, right? Friday, May 17th is 65 years. And so we just wanted to take a break from the scholarship and hear from people who are living with the ways that we've implemented Brown v. Board and the stories that we've told ourselves about that implementation. Yeah, we wanted to spend this week just really listening. Greg and Carol both independently reached out to us after having come across this podcast, and they were willing to share their stories with each other, with us, and, and with you. Of course, we need a little disclaimer in here, right? This is not some sort of investigative journalism piece and certainly not a definitive look at the quote unquote black experience. You know, it's a, it's a sharing from two black parents who, who live in different parts of the country and who have had very different and yet in many ways very similar educational experiences uh, for their children. And so, I, you know, I think the the ways that they overlap is really telling. Yeah, I'm deeply moved and deeply grateful for Greg and Carol's willingness to share their stories with us and... It's not always, you know, easy to hear, but... But we need to, so let's hear it. Hey, Greg, how are you? Nice to, like, nice to meet you. I'm so good. Nice to meet you, too. Greg, do you want to start and introduce yourself? I'm Greg, African-American dad. Married with five kids, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> and I have two girls and uh, three books. Bo- no, no, I don't. I have three girls. <laughs> this is the best <laughs> intro ever. Yes. <laughs> and I'm just very, very, very concerned about the education of my children. You know, my wife and I will do whatever we need to do to make sure that they get what we feel is the best education that we can afford them. Where do you live, Greg? So I live in uh, Oxford, Michigan, which is 50 minutes um, north of Detroit. And what kind of schools do your kids go to? They're in public schools, um, but they are, you know, one of few African-American kids in the district. And you moved to that district for the schools, right, Greg? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Carol, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Carol, an African-American mom from Atlanta. And I have three children, a 13-year-old boy who is in private school and has been there since the second grade. And then I have a four-year-old about to go into pre-K and I have a two-year-old. Like Greg said, just from the beginning, very early on, just very concerned about education and wanting the best and trying to find the best situations for my child. You know, we've, we've had some bumps along the way. And, you know, just to be honest, I just don't feel like the decisions that I have made have actually been the best for him, mm. which is tough. Just like Carol said, there are times where I wonder if I've made the right decision. There were unintended consequences with the move. What are the things that you thought you were going to get? And then what are the things that you feel like maybe you didn't expect that that you ended up getting? You know, one thing, the community is very it's a close knit community. You know, the high school basketball team made it made a run in the state playoffs and the community all went, you know, to the games. I took my son to them and that's cool. That's a good thing. You know, the parks are nice there. However, we are in a constant state of contradiction. And so I moved. I, I moved into the white neighborhood. But I'm always thinking about the neighborhood I left. Mm-hmm. I, you know, decided to move to the white neighborhood to get the quote unquote good schools, to get the the resources to. And I feel some kind of way about that, too. It's just a constant inner struggle. Just constantly. Yeah, my my son's thirteen, and I've got I've got two younger kids who are just now about to like embark on the whole school thing, and I'm I'm already seeing where I'm going to do things totally different. Like I'm not moving to an area where it's predominantly white because the schools are quote unquote good. 
And honestly, and what makes them so good is because they're predominantly white. And that's what that's what people think. It's like, you know, we're going to go to the white neighborhood because the white schools are better. And I just don't I just want to get out of that that mindset. It's hard. I remember saying to my son, um, we went to one of his friend's high school games and, you know, we live in the South and like bands are really big and mm-hmm. just a Friday night football game and just watching the black kids. I mean, just go off in the bandstand. I mean, it was amazing. And I was just looking at my son and I was like, I, I literally said to him, I said, I don't know if I'm doing you a disservice because you have never experienced this right here. And he's just looking at me like, what are you talking about? Like, you just always so deep. And I'm like, no, like, I really think that I've done you a disservice for not having you around your culture. And I don't want you to feel like there's anything wrong with your culture. And so I want to I want to put you back into it. I want you to soak it up. I want you to go to a Friday night football game and be in the bandstand and watch the girls dance. And I just and I want you to experience it. Mm. My son was um, a student, used the N-word. Um, he's in fifth grade, and, my, you know, my mm-hmm. son has already heard the N-word. And um, the school decided to do a book study for the eighth graders on a book. I think it's called Day of Tears, and it was talking about a fictional slave auction. Wow. And my daughter, I think she might have been the only African-American girl in her class. You know, that the school sent the email out notifying all the parents that they were going to do this. They said they was going to cross out the N-word. Because <laughs> <laughs> that'll make it better. And so they sent out an email. I went to the school. I talked to her teacher. The, the email went to all the eighth grade parents. But when I got to the school and I asked the teacher how many other parents had asked her about the book, she said none. So that made me wonder, am I the only one concerned about race here? Not that you're the only one that's not concerned. You're the only one it affects. True. Mm-hmm. Very true. <laughs> Like I told, like, don't make my daughter the example. Don't make hers have to speak for an entire race. That that doesn't surprise me one single bit. My son's school did a trip to D.C. and the itinerary had them visiting everywhere. They didn't have time to go to a baseball game. But uh, the one museum that was not on there <laughs> was mm. the African-American Museum. And when mm. I sent an email... They were like, oh, well, you know what? We didn't think we would have time. I went to the school and I said, so you're trying to tell me you have time to attend a baseball game, Mm. but you don't have time to go to this one museum. Why don't you cut one of the other ones out? And the fact that I even had to mention this just further lets me know that y'all are just so disconnected and your whole diversity and inclusion team. It's just for show. Oh, they have a whole team. It's just for show. We have a team Mm. at my son's school. Why did you enroll your son at this largely white private school in the first place? Like, what was the what was the hope? Oh, gosh, the resources, the the opportunities, just thinking that the education was, quote unquote, better. I wanted better for my son. And and so it's, it's hard for me to at the time to think that he was going to thrive in our little neighborhood school. So my hope was that he was going to get to the school and he was going to thrive and everything was going to be great. And, you know, but we we definitely had obstacles along the way. When he first started out, you know, Black History Month came and and I'm one of those parents. I don't expect school to teach 100 percent of anything. And I do know that part of our history is I have to teach him. It's not something that's in the textbook and it's not anybody can just water down and give to him. But I was really concerned that we didn't have not even a Black History program, but just anything the whole month of February. And I I would literally ask him every single day, like, what did y'all talk about today? Did y'all did y'all have anything about Black History? And then it was like the last week of February, my son got invited to speak at a black history program that was on the weekend on a Saturday. And that was the extent of black history. So it was it was optional, of course. Totally extracurricular. Totally extracurricular on the weekend, knowing that children have, you know, other things going on, soccer, baseball, football, whatever, knowing that they're not going to come. So, you know, we did that. We did that song and dance for years up until last year my son just was like I'm just not even doing it I just don't even want to do it I totally can relate to that Carol like yeah go the whole month and not talk about black history at all come on now yeah and it's (laughs) 
And for them, it's just like, well, you know, our curriculum is, you know, and they know, and it's not like we have to focus on it. And then mind you, my child was one of two or three African-American boys from second grade to fifth grade while he was at this school. Wow. So they, so they were like, our, our Black History Month will be, we'll let one of our three African-American students speak on a Saturday when no one will show up. Correct. Mm-hmm. But we're really confused as to why we don't have a lot of, quote, diversity at this Exactly. Point. You know, and then as he gets older, it's just hard having the, the real conversations with him. I, uh, my son was talking about swimming and he's a competitive swimmer. And he was saying that he wanted to swim at Howard, which is, you know, HBCU. And he's talking about it and just having a great conversation. And I'm sort of walking behind him and his friends and his friends like, why would you even want to go there? That's not even a good school. You should probably swim for Auburn or something like that. Mm. And my son was just like, well, what do you know about the school? Like, how do you know it's not a good school? And he was just like, I mean, because it's like people don't really do well at those schools. And he was like, well, how do you know that? Have you been? Do you know anybody that's gone to that school that hasn't done well? And the little boy was just like, I just think it's just a, a, a dumb idea for you to go to a school like that if, if you really want to succeed in life. And my son was just like, dude, shut up. Like, you don't even know. <laughs> it was it was funny to hear my son sort of speak up for herself, but it was it was heartbreaking at the same time because I'm looking like, Jesus, is that what y'all really think? So because he wants to go to a historically black college, it's, it's, it's not that good. I think it speaks to, to, to what you have done as a parent to have, yeah. you know, that he hasn't internalized that in the same way, because I think that's hard. You've got to put in a lot of effort on that. It constantly has me thinking as he got older throughout the day, what kind of like microaggression are you dealing with on a day to day basis at school? And I, I know my son's strong will and I know he's strong and I know he can, you know, he can stand up for himself. But at the end of the day, I'm like, this may have been the worst decision that I have made for him because I don't know how I'm breaking him down or how it's breaking him down psychologically to have to go through and, you know, just little things each day. I had his English teacher tell me in seventh grade, I have no idea how he got this far. He doesn't have basic grammar. And this, you know, this was just an English class. And I was like, well, that's very odd because he's been here since second grade. So that's on y'all. And he was like, oh, he's been at, at this school since second grade. I said, yes, he has. <laughs> and, and then the same teacher, we found out my son was going to tutorial and he wasn't helping him. He would tell him, you know, that's just I just can't believe you're asking me that. You just need to Google it. Wow. And when I and when I when I approached the teacher about it, he was just like, well, I was just joking. And I turned to my son. And I said, did it sound like a joke to you? And he said, no, it didn't. He said, because my friend asked the same exact question and he would answer him. And my son has told me, oh, he just doesn't like me because I'm black. But here I am every single morning dropping you off to a school where you you feel like one of your teachers don't like you because you're black. It killed me. Yeah. Greg, you when you guys were looking at trying to decide what neighborhood to live in, trying to figure out, you, you moved to this neighborhood for the schools. What was the sort of narrative around w- why this is a good school, what a good school is? Yeah, the um, so the district where we moved to, um, the entire district is IB. Mm. Um, mm. Oh, wow. And I'm, and I'm not even exaggerating. The high school, it sits up on a hill. Just geographically, Mm -hmm. (laughs) it it sits up on the heat. The football field, they have blue turf. (laughs) I mean, it's it's another world. When I was in high school and I went to, you know, my neighborhood school, I thought I was doing pretty good in my school. And then the, the county decided they wanted sister schools. They wanted you to go see another high school. And we, I went in 11th grade to see this other high school and it was in a suburban area it, and it was just built that year. And it was beautiful. <laughs> and maybe my memory is off, but I think seven college recruiters came to that school that day. They had like, wow. now this is a public school, not a private, it's public. Back in my high school, we only, I think, th- I would say at most five college recruiters came to see us that year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. You know, the, the military was there all the time. Right. Fast forward 20 years <laughs> and it's still the same. But I will also say in the same breath, I feel some kind of way be- that I left the kids in that other neighborhood. Because in my opinion, 
and I, I'm going to just say this how I want to say it. My kids aren't special. Um, we'll make sure to send them a clip of that. Right, exactly. 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 <laughs> I mean, all kids are special. Yeah. And if all kids had the same resources, the kids will flourish. You know, like my, my kids, I do feel that they are doing well. I do. I, and I will also say that there are some adults in the schools that they do care and they are thinking about race. But that doesn't take away my anxiety mm-hmm. every single day. This this decision to integrate is not just the in thing to do for parents of color. We thinking a lot about how this is going to affect our children. It's it's not just an easy, casual decision. I feel like both of you have moved to these schools for the resources. And I'm just thinking about how expensive these resources are to like the soul. Yes. I took this phrase from a friend of ours that said pre-forgiveness. Like I'm, I'm forgiving myself now for whatever my children would have to endure when they are adults because they're going to this school. All the microaggression, mm-hmm. I'm pre-forgiving myself. I'm saying they're going to be okay. And I don't know if, I don't know if that's true. They're strong. And, and we really talk to them. I mean, we, we really, like, when that boy called my son the N-word, that turned into, like, a three-hour discussion at our house. Yep. <laughs> And then now I got to go to the school and talk to the teacher. That takes up more of my time and my resources. And I'm always playing this constant struggle like, should I go say something? Oh, I don't gosh. Want- Me too. <laughs> right. I'm the only one of few African-American parents. I don't want to go up there and they be like, oh, here come the angry black man. Yep. Mm-hmm. You get that. You so oh. get that feeling. You so get that feeling. Every time you have a problem, it's like you second guess yourself. Like, well, maybe it's not that bad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I had to stop. I just had to stop telling myself, like, no, it is that bad. If it bothers me, then it's bad. If you can complain about having peanut butter in the lunchroom, you damn right. I yeah. complain about my son feeling like his teacher doesn't like him because he's black. I just, yeah. I've had enough. I'm not going to keep, you know, second guessing what I feel is right for my child. And I've, I've gotten to the point now where I, you know, I don't even like for my son to hang out with his friends. It's just, it's such a different atmosphere. And it is heartbreaking sometimes because literally he wanted to hang out with his friends on Halloween and I couldn't even let him go because we don't live in that same neighborhood. And my son is often the only black child And I just didn't want anything to happen to him. And trying to explain that to a white mom was literally the hardest thing because she really did not understand my concern. My concern for the boys going out and playing a prank and having a good time that was really lighthearted. And it was just something that you do as a teenager. Nothing harmful. If I'm not there and I can't protect him and if someone zooms in and see, oh, it's a black kid with them and then they're angry about that, I No. So those little small pieces of innocence that I'm just robbing my child of, I feel like every single day. Hey, mom, we're going to play a prank. We were going to jump in somebody's pool. Oh, no, sweetheart. You can't do that. Mm -mm, You can't. Or everybody else did it. And we were just having a good time. And she was watching out her window. Yeah, absolutely not. Because if her dad looks out the window and sees you in his pool, Mm. then what? How do we know how he feels about it? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's just socially, I just feel like he's, I'm just, I'm just breaking him down day by day. My son's like really into hip hop and, you know, he likes sneakers and he likes Jordans and he likes hoodies. And it would to the point where he would go and when I did let him go and hang out with his friends, I tried to switch him up. Why don't you tuck your shirt? Why do you have to wear those sneakers? Why don't you wear your khakis? Mm. I couldn't even let my son be who he was. And I'm trying to dress him for, it's like for a part. Like, I want him to look a certain way before he walks out the door. It was awful. And I couldn't believe that I that I was doing that to him. Carol, you brought this to my remembrance. Um, we had sat down as a family and we watched The Hate You Give. Mm-hmm. And um, 
at the end, you know, has extras. Um, one of the extras talked about code switching. Yeah, yeah. And after we got done watching it, my oldest, she said she's at the high school. So there are some children of color at the high school. But she said, Daddy, I don't feel like I code switch when I'm with my uh, white friends. I feel like I code switch when I'm with my black friends. Wow. Which, and, and then she also said, well, you know, mom and dad, y'all don't, y'all don't necessarily act black. <laughs> There's the stereotype. And I think this is something with white supremacy. With white supremacy, that whiteness means the whole gap. You could be at the low end of the spectrum or at the high end of the spectrum for whites. That's they get they get that privilege. But for African Americans, there's a stereotype, and I got to teach them that you are not the stereotype. And I know that my daughter is assimilating. I know. That she is, you know, to want to belong, want to, yep. want to, you know, have friends. And and so I get why she said the things that she said. And this is my job as a father to teach her that you are an African-American. We are black. <laughs> uh, and whatever your perception is, you have to include us in that, too. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of my friends are not sending their kids to private school. And not only is it because of the cost, but it's just it's it it's exhausting. It's exhausting to go to social events and have to, quote unquote, code switch. Mm-hmm. It's exhausting being the only black person in the room. I, I, I went to an event and I literally had a lady stop me mid conversation to say, you know, the school offers financial aid. Wow. Wow. That has it had nothing to do with we were not even talking about school, but it's like she was doing me a favor. She had to just let me in on that little piece of information. I get to insult you and look like a great white person all at the same time. Yeah, that's amazing. It's just it just feels so wrong. And, you know, I'm complaining about my neighborhood being gentrified, but I'm also part of that problem because my son doesn't even go to the neighborhood school. I'm driving him outside of the city limits just to get him a quote unquote good education when I've got a a school that he can go to in my backyard. So it's like the smog we talk about, right? Like what this good education means and and what we're willing to give up for it. Oh, we've, we've given up tons, tons. And I just and all you could keep thinking in the back of your head is like, this is what he needs. This is me being a good parent. It turns out that I was just wrong. And I and I can admit that that it was it was the wrong move. Like, do we does he have some good friends? Absolutely. He does. Does he have some not so good friends that I don't let him go to their parents house? (laughs) Absolutely. But on the flip side, it would be the same thing in our neighborhood. But at least it's our neighborhood and it's our community. Mm. I'm not driving him outside of our city limits because our school isn't good enough anymore. It's just it's exhausting. It's tiring. And it's just not right. It's like these schools that supposedly have everything don't actually have the tools to really reach your kids, right? Like, yep. Greg, you were telling us before we started recording here about a, a video you watched from Dr. Vanessa Siddle Walker. That video seemed to resonate with you, didn't it? I think Dr. Um, Walker really summed it up. There was a way that black people wanted integration to work, but it didn't work that way. What they looked at integration, it was an additive model. So black teachers knew how they knew aspiration. They knew how to make black kids believe that they could become anything. Black teachers knew how to advocate for black children, but they didn't have access to resources and things like that. But when integration happened, what Dr. Walker said is that it moved from an additive model to an exchange model. And so when you integrated, when we integrated, they got rid of the black teachers. Now the black kids have no one to aspire them. They have no one to advocate for them and they have limited access. So, Carol, you you know, I I think that we both felt like we were going to get access. But 
We don't have anyone, any adults that's aspiring the kids at the school. And we don't have anyone that's fighting on their behalf. Yeah. But then, now this was a big reason why I left, or why we moved, is because I felt that global majority schools, I, I feel as though they are being poisoned by racism too, because they may have black teachers and all of that, but the school climate feels more like a prison. Real. The school to prison pipeline is real. Mm. No, I, I I totally I totally agree with that as well. It's like a piece of this that has to do with expectations. It has to do with what do teachers think is possible for for your kids compared to the other kids in the school. So you know, my daughter's in the ninth grade. She has a four point She's doing well, and I ain't bragging, but I'm excited. I am happy about that. You should you, you should brag, brag about that. <laughs> That's legit. You already but, said your kids weren't special. You can right. you can round that out a little. <laughs> I'm trying, to, but but no one encouraged her to take the AP class for the next year. Mm. You know, like so, no one's advocating. So I got to call and I got to push. I asked her how many how many African American kids do you think will be in your AP class next year, and she's like, I don't think it's going to be any, but me. Mm. Greg, that's so funny that you that you say that because my son had a, a similar experience, but it was with a band. Oh. He plays an instrument and he's he's really good at that instrument. And they have an opportunity for kids to play in like a smaller ensemble. And I remember thinking like, gosh, I'd really love for him to play in that. When I was talking to him about it, he was like, yeah, it seems cool. And the pieces seem really difficult. And I, I think I would really like it. And I said, so has anyone talked to you about joining it? He was like, no, I don't even know what to do. And I was like, okay, I was like, well, I'll reach out to the orchestra teacher and I'll ask about it. And so, you know, I reached out and said, hey, he's interested in joining this ensemble. And I know he's got the talent. I know he can play the pieces. And she's like, oh, well, I just I never gave him the information on it because I didn't think he was interested. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, well, who did you give int- information to? And she said, well, the majority of the kids in the class got it. And I'm like, well, well, how come he didn't? I just didn't think he was interested. You know, it's so hard to be in that space because you, you want to think that she didn't do it because he was black. I, I know that that's not what she did. But then the, but then the other voice is tapping you on the shoulder like, girl, yes, she did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if not <laughs> that, exactly then what? Yeah. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's such a hard space to be in. And it's, it's so hard to not come off as defensive every single time. But you know, at, there are some things that you just don't leave me a choice at because you really had no reason not to give it to him. And you couldn't even give me a reason. All right. <laughs> just vague enough that you can't, you know, like it, it's hard to fight this jello. Yeah. <laughs> right. You can't argue. Yes, you did think he'd be interested. And, and may, you know, I mean, did, did she sit down one day and say, hmm, he's black. He probably isn't interested. Probably not. But she wasn't aware of her tendency to do that. Exactly. You you hit the nail right on the head. I think that's a lot of what happens at school. I don't I don't a hundred percent think that it's always, you know, it's intentional. But the fact that you're not in tune and you don't know after all the training and all the people that you bring in. Yep. I was thankful when my son had a few um, black teachers. I communicated a lot more with the teachers. I knew they had my son's back and I knew that they would call me if he was slacking off. Whereas though now, you know, it's just like, well, he he did it, but I didn't I didn't feel like I needed to email you. And I'm like, well, hold him accountable if he's done something wrong. Don't don't think that I don't care because I, I'm, I'm that parent. If he's done something or he hasn't done something, he hasn't turned some work in. I need to know that I'm, I'm a parent just like anybody else is. We just didn't want to trouble you. You're not troubling me. He's at school. <laughs> You're not calling is troubling me. Yeah, exactly. You're leaving me in the dark about my kid is what's troubling me. And then when he comes home and I'm looking at a progress report and I'm like, well, gee, what happened? Well, I didn't I didn't turn in this, this, this and this. And when I reach out to the teacher, like, well, we just really didn't want to just bother you. And, I, and you know, I've asked I've asked my other friends. Mother white mom friends and they're like, oh, we we always talk to him. He emails us every time he's missing an assignment. This this year, he not, he does not have one honest to God good relationship with any of his teachers. Am I expecting him to have that every single year? Absolutely not. But 
the fact that you don't have one teacher that you feel like you can go to that can advocate for you, that you feel comfortable with, is worrisome to me. And that's, that's I mean, that's the majority of the reason why I'm taking him out of the school. You are. Oh, yeah, I'm pulling I'm pulling him out. He's a good student. He's athletic. Um, he's humble. He's like he's everything that they want. He's that diverse piece that they like need. And so the day that I'm assuming that it got out, I got three phone calls from the diversity team. So just so, so worried. Why wouldn't you reach out to me? Why would you not tell me? Why are you leaving? What school is he going to? And then when I told her that he was going to our neighborhood school, she was like, oh, he's going to be in a culture shock. Er, why? <laughs> That's his culture, though. Why? What's a culture shock for him? I'm confused why you're concerned. That's not going to be a good environment for him. Well, these are literally the kids that live in our neighborhood. What's going to be wrong with the environment? Oh, he's just not going to thrive there, and, and they're not going to be able to hold on to him. And what kind of programs do they have at the school? I get it. I get that you're a private school, and you do have a lot more resources than a public school. But at the end of the day, he's still going to be educated. I'm pretty sure he'll still go to any college that he wants to go to. He's just going to have to work his butt off, and nothing's going to be handed to him. And it just it just amazes me that that that's all she could say. Now, and this is another black woman. Mm-hmm. Oh. And I think that so many people are wrapped up into their, you know, their educational experience for their kids being purely educational. But there's a whole different side to that, too. You got You got to remember it's a whole child. You got to teach to the whole child, not just the educational portion. And I feel like that's where I sort of messed up with my son, <sighs> just taking away that that culture from him. I just can't believe I just let it go on for so long. I, I, I have a story like so my oldest boy, when he was in fourth grade, he was getting in, in trouble in his Spanish class. And so I've set up a meeting with his teacher and she was saying how rambunctious he is and blah, blah, blah. And, and I, you know, received everything that she said. And then before we left the conference, I said, um, I, I, I'm not saying that my boy doesn't misbehave. But I also want you to be aware of that he's the only African-American boy in the class. And I don't want the other kids in the class to think that he's acting up because he's African-American. And I think if if you had a good relationship with him, he would do much better. And, you know, and and you don't know how much I didn't want to say it. That's the truth. (laughs) But ever since then, you know, the teacher saw my wife one day and was like, he's a star student. But it's because you finally decided to have a relationship with him. I just, it did. That just blows my mind that we even have to tell you to have a relationship with our child. Like, is you like, you need the okay first. Right. (laughs) Remember my son, his, I think it was his third grade, maybe his fourth grade teacher, just literally just fessing up to me at like a parent teacher conference. Like, I don't really yell at him because he's just so handsome and I just don't expect him to just just know all the work that he should and get everything done. And I'm looking at her like she has six heads. I'm like, what what the hell is that supposed to mean? He's handsome. So you don't yell at him. So you're cutting him a break because he's the cute black kid. And I I just had to tell her from that point on. I said, okay, so from this point on, like that stops. Like we don't I hold him accountable at home. So I'm expecting you to do the same. I don't want him being treated special because. (laughs) <laughs> because he's black. <laughs> That's crazy. And it's Greg. It's funny that Greg said that because, you know, it's, it's I hate to tell you, like, I don't feel like my kids are special. Mm-hmm. My kids are kids, mm-hmm. just like everybody else's kids. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because the, when we think about the problems around race and discipline in schools, you know, in, in these global majority schools led by largely white administration and white staff, the problem is often sort of the opposite of what you have experienced, right? It's like the yeah. the, the kids of color are the ones who get the most discipline and, and disproportionate and unfair discipline. Mm-hmm. But but your experience is actually the opposite. And that's not that's not actually helpful. No, it's not. It's not helpful at all. Because I don't like I said, I don't want him to feel like I'm just going to get away with whatever I want to get away with. It made me think of the other story when we were in like a, the parent meeting. Some big event had happened at the school. And we were sitting, all the parents were sitting around and we were talking about it. And the one parent just was like, well, I don't talk about that kind of stuff with my kids because we just don't need to. And it was, it was around something about some violence. 
And, you know, I just sat up and I just said, you know, what a privilege you have not to be able to have to speak about that stuff to your child. Mm -hmm. When it happens, I said, because in my house, we talk about it every single day. Mm -hmm. And I said, you see, but I said, but you have that privilege and I don't. And I said, and that bothers me. Well, I just don't think that, you know, my kids need to be talking about this heavy kind of stuff. I said, I feel for you. I feel that you don't feel like your kids need it. I said, but I don't have those options. I just don't. And it just is it's meetings like those, like those those parent meetings where I've just got to constantly be the one in the room. Like, hate to pop your bubble, but there is somebody here that has to do that on a daily basis. It's exhausting. It's exhausting to go and be that voice. It's exhausting to go and be in those spaces. And sometimes I just don't have it. Like, I just don't have the mental space for it. Yeah, it is exhausting. It's tiresome. But then I, this what this is what keeps me going. I, I think about Ruby Bridges. Yeah, yeah. I think about, you know, James Meredith in Mississippi I think about Thurgood Marshall. So that keeps me going. I, I think about the ancestors, you know, those who have gone through. I read a lot of you know, books about you know, the Civil War and Reconstruction. And I, and I just, I feel like if they can make it, then I'm going to have to make it too. Uh, it's exhausting. Don't get me wrong. I just try to tap into the ancestors. I try to. I, that's what I do. Well, I think for for me, in some of the spaces that I've entered, it's almost like I want a seat at their table. And and then sometimes I, in in all actuality, I don't. I have my own table with my own chairs, and I don't necessarily have to have a seat at your table. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I feel like a lot of times going into those spaces is they're offended when I do speak my mind or and speaking my truth is all I'm doing. I'm not mm-hmm. not here to cause any problems or to stir up anything. All I'm doing is speaking my truth and what's real to me. Yeah. It gets tiring to have to constantly know that I'm about to go in this meeting and mm-hmm. hear some BS that I'm not going to like. And I've got to sit there and twiddle my thumbs and try to figure out if I'm going to try to write what y'all just said. That's that's the biggest thing for me is I just want them to know that sometimes it's not all about me trying to come into your space and take over because I'm not that's not what I'm here to do. But um, I am here to make you aware. I'm here to, to open your mind to let you see that, you know, my life is not like your life. And those conversations that you opt out of, I have to have them. So imagine how I feel having to talk to my son about issues that you don't want to talk about because you're uncomfortable with with your kids. You don't think I'm uncomfortable with some of the conversations I have to have with my child. I was talking to one of my white mom friends a few weeks ago. We were talking about our kids driving and she was like, you know, it's like, I hope you don't mind me saying this. She was like, but I, I can't imagine being in your shoes and having to have the conversations that you have with your son about driving. She said, because I don't have to have those conversations Mm -hmm. I don't have to tell him when a police officer approaches you, you know, keep your hands on the wheel. And she said, it's frightening. She said, not just, I don't even know how you even do it. But I did appreciate that she knew and she recognized that the conversations that we have at our home are very different than what she has at her home. You know, and I would say, too, that I think the system, the white supremacy system has caused many of them not to know because we just don't talk about race at all. Like, no, they don't want to talk about it. People are always like, when you say white privilege, they get so offended. And it's, it's not right. it's not an offense. It's a matter of fact. Right. But people get so offended by it. You know, some days I do just want to just crawl under my bed and just stay there and just not have to deal with some of this stuff. But like I said, I don't I don't have that choice. Right. And I'm not saying that, you know, when I move my son to public school next year, that everything's going to be great and I'm never going to have these conversations again in life and I'm not going to have to deal with this kind of stuff. I am. I definitely am. But I feel like the conversations would be a lot more open and a lot easier to have because I'm outside of that bubble. Mm. Will you come back on yeah. a year from now or something and tell us how it's, how it's going? You'd be like, after, yeah, after my son stopped hating me, I sure will. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I'm, I'm struck by something and I, I, I hope I can say this in a way that, that isn't offensive, but like you guys have such low expectations and and your schools are still failing you. 
Like, mm-hmm. I feel like you're, you, you guys are clearly really intentional and conscious about this and doing such amazing things for your kids to fight back against this. And like your expectations for what the school could possibly provide are, you know, like you, you're just hoping for a little bit of black history month and, and you can't yeah. even get it right. Like forget like year round culturally relevant pedagogy, forget, right. you know, a, a, any of that. It's like, just give me like a tiny bit of black history month and you can't even get that. You're like, <laughs> and the flyer, just a one flyer for band. Right. Like, yep. like your job is, is it, to teach your daughter that it's okay to be black. <laughs> like you would never even think that the school could do that or take that on, or you, that you would even think of asking your school to do that. Right. Like, like Carol, I think you said, right. You, like you don't expect your son to have a teacher that has high expectations of him every year, but maybe like once or twice over the course of his schooling, right? Like, you know, you, you, it's like normal to have to ask your teacher for a relationship with your kids. Greg, you have to draw inspiration from these historic epic struggles of people of color in this country, just to be able to keep doing the day to day. Like how how did we get here? How is that? Okay. How, how are we here? You're, I feel like the the expectations are pretty low. Like we don't, I'm not really asking for a whole lot. And what I found time and time again is going to like all these diversity and inclusion meetings is that all the parents of color, we're there, we're showing up. And I remember one of the last ones I went to and I'm looking around and I, I just raised my hand. I said, y'all talking to the wrong people. Yeah. Y'all got all the parents of color in here talking about diversity and inclusion and Y'all talking to the wrong parents. We're not the ones that's supposed to be in here. Let me get some of your white parents in here. Those are the ones that need, that need to be in this space, in this building, talking about it. If I've, if I've told you that my black son has a, a problem with his white male teacher and you don't have the tools or the resources to figure that out and to break it down and to figure out what to do, yeah, you need some additional staff training. So all this money that y'all have for the for these extra programs that make some of these other parents attend some of these diversity and inclusion meetings. Because you we're not the parents that you need to be talking to. We know. We get it. We're here. Mm-hmm. Where are they? Yeah. Hey, I wish we my school had a meeting like that, had a diversity meeting. Hey Greg, go ahead and start one up, Greg. Here we go. <laughs> oh, here you go. My wife already is like <laughs> <laughs> you can't. Somebody, somebody's got to start it. Somebody's got to. The- don't do that, Carol. Don't do that to me. Hey, I'm just saying. <laughs> somebody's got to put the footwork in it. Sometimes you got to be that change. So it's really. I mean, we had we had a an author come to our school, and without giving that author's name, but she's pretty controversial. And we had some of our our white parents at the school angry that this this African American author came to the school to talk to our kids. And was like really angry, like threatening mm-hmm. to pull their kids out. Oh, and the school buckled and made it optional for the kids to go. But when we have when we have Civil War speakers, our kids are mandatory. It's mandatory for them to go. Oh. I, uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm not interested in standing up for white people. I think we're the problem. <laughs> but <laughs> I, um, but I, I am I am struck. I feel like. You know, to sort of to sort of tie back to to Brown v. Board here, we we think of Brown v. Board as this sort of monumental shift from racist to not racist. You know that that was sort of the end of it. That the the moral arc of the universe bent towards justice that day, and then we were done with it. And all of the ways that we then continued to oppress communities of color were ostensibly colorblind. We're not explicitly racist, but we're implicitly racist. And so we took away the ability to have these conversations because now, you know, why are you talking about race? We're sort of done with that was the idea. And, And we didn't, we didn't build up any capacity to have these meaningful conversations from white people. I mean, it's uncomfortable. It's scary. Like, you know, I mean, every time we, we tape a podcast, it's like I, I sit with this discomfort, this sort of fear of all the ways that we're going to screw this up, yeah. but it's, it's a skill set that we don't ask people to develop. And because society caters to white people and puts a really high premium on white people comfort, right? Like that seems to be like the most important thing is like, how do we keep white people comfortable? You're so right on that. So we never so we never get into it. And so when things get a little bit hairy and a little bit awkward and a little bit uncomfortable, it's like, whoa, let's just not yeah. do this. Let's sort of, you know, maybe we could just like hire a couple of people of color to talk to the people of color because like I, I don't want to be in that. It's super uncomfortable. Or we'll watch one Rosa Parks documentary. There you yeah. go. 
That happens. You write about it, Andy. You know, I'm, I'm listening to your conversation, thinking about like, this is the legacy. Yeah. Like after, after 65 years, this is where we are. And I, I guess I'm wondering, like, does Brown v. Board feel like it has any significance to you? Yeah, that's the legacy. You know, there was another Supreme Court case. And I think Dr. Kirkland talked about like Milliken v. Bradley. Mm-hmm. And that's a that's a case we don't talk about. You know, we know everybody knows Brown v. Board, but that Milliken v. Bradley case, Thurgood Marshall said, this ruling will undo my life's work. So, so Brown v. Board got rid of segregation in the South, but it didn't do it in the North. And that's what Milliken v. Bradley would have done. Yeah. But it didn't. And, and, and ironically, that case was Southeastern Michigan. This happened before my time, but I grew up in Pontiac. And during those early 70s in Pontiac, they, they wanted to integrate the schools in Pontiac School District. And with busing and the Ku Klux Klan blew up 10 buses. Wow. They blew up 10 buses. The white people that were living in Pontiac moved north to Lake Orion and to Oxford, where I'm at now. And that's the legacy. That was 40 years ago. Yeah, we still dealing with this. And see, and I'm going to just say this, like, I I don't even care that I'm saying where I'm, I'm at because I want this stuff to get out. I want everybody to know that this stuff hasn't been solved. Oh. Um, you you can you can say that again. It's like yeah, and we we have been we we've, we've been conditioned to make white people comfortable, and mm-hmm. I'm just I'm just to the point now where I'm just like I I just don't I I can't do that anymore. Um, what do you wish the majority of our listeners couldn't could know? No, I I hope they hear it in our voices. Yeah, the struggle that parents of color are going through to deal with the the education of their children. I I hope they can empathize with us. I I, I hope those parents will think about it if they had to, if they had to live in a completely different country, in a completely different culture that didn't value their children. That's what I think we go through. Mm. But we're in a country that is supposedly ours. Mm. Like I, I, I read about Frederick Douglass said something to the point of like this this nation doesn't love all of its children, and and I just got to deal with that. You know, I just got to I got to deal with that. It's it's hard, but like I said, I got to go look to these iconic role models to keep going. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Well, I, well I'm over here worried about worksheets and behavior charts and are there enough field trips? You know, I, I guess for me, and I, I hate to just be plain and simple, but your kids aren't special. Mm-hmm. And in that same token, neither is mine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It boggles my mind that we try to draw maps to, to exclude certain neighborhoods and when all, all children deserve the same education and the same opportunities. It makes no sense that you, you have a school that has resources above and beyond. And then we have some schools that are barely making it, barely have enough textbooks. And, you know, yeah. just know that everybody is not in your situation. The, the school that my daughter is about to go to pre-K at, some of these kids won't eat if they're not at school. And that's the reality that people need to see. Like everybody doesn't have what you have and come on out your bubble. Just, just sometimes I know it's uncomfortable, but you know, it's, it's necessary. Doesn't mean that those parents care any less about their their kids than you care about yours, but it's just reality. You guys, you two are also not special. <laughs> I'm, and there's the closer. So, Thanks, everybody. I'm, 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 I don't know. I'm like sitting here. I'm sitting here with just like a very heavy heart, and 
but also yeah. recognizing that your stories are different in their own ways and also not unique. And you are not yeah. the only people. Yeah, definitely. You're not the only people dealing with this, you know, no, and, and this is this is the this is the reality that we've created. But. Mm-hmm. Andrew, thank you for that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was getting a little heavy. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, well, I I can't thank you two enough for joining us, for sharing your stories with us, for helping open yeah. our eyes and our listeners' eyes. No, to, no worry to the reality that that you guys are living. No worries at all. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. I, I thank you all for just this attempt in trying to tackle this gigantic topic. Yeah. Yeah. So Andrew, I have, um, I've thought about this conversation a lot since we recorded it. Yeah, me too. And I kind of think we need to just let this sit. Like we can shut up. Yeah. It's not really our forte, but I think think we can. (laughs) Yeah, uh, we'll we'll take a second to urge you all to share this episode. You know, the the stories about school desegregation didn't end with Brown v. Board, and the challenges that parents of color still face are really important. Yeah, absolutely. And I also want to say that if you have appreciated Greg and Carol's time to educate us, please feel free to send a note to hello at integratedschools dot org, and we'll forward your comments to them. And with that, I know I'll be thinking a lot about Brown v. Board this week, and certainly Greg and Carol as well. Me too. And we are happy to be in this with you as we try to know better and do better. See you next week.